Welcome to Revolutionizing Activism. I'm Steve Lambert. I am the co-founder and artistic director of the Center for Artistic Activism. This talk today I'm really excited to share because it's with a few artists that have worked with food in ways that I found really inspiring. Um, we've got Tunde Wei, who's a Nigerian chef, who's found some really unconventional ways to talk about gentrification, economic inequality, and racism in Nashville specifically through a restaurant. And similar, uh, John Rubin and Don Walensky, who are from Conflict Kitchen, who set up a temporary restaurant for seven years in Pittsburgh that served food only from countries that the United States is in conflict with. But there's a lot more to these projects than those descriptions. And often when we learn about these, we get the short version um, on a website or at an exhibition or just told through word of mouth. One of the nice things about being at the Center for Artistic Activism is through our workshops, through our talks, through just the, the uh, places we get to go in the world, we get to have much longer conversations with the practitioners that do this work and find out their insights, what this project started out as versus what it finished as, what it became, what it became after, um, and the thinking that went into them. And that's really what's exciting about this talk is that you get to learn all about the scope of these projects, where they came from, how they evolved, the thinking behind them. And um, the reason that we do this is so that you can learn from this. And the lessons that are learned through doing these kinds of projects get shared um, as opposed to lost or held by only a few people. So I hope you enjoy the talk. I think there can be a lot that you can get out of it, not just about how you can use food as a project to connect people or to reach people as a medium, as they talk about in the, in the conversation, but underlying ideas uh, that go along with that that might help your work in general. By the way, let us know if you have any other exciting food-based examples of projects. We run a site called Actopedia.org that has examples of all different kinds of artistic activism that are user submitted. So you can send it there or you can comment on this video and let us know about it that way. Um, we always like to collect those examples. Uh, this conversation was moderated by my colleague, Steve Duncombe, and here it is. The other Steve did an intro about why food was so important to him politically. But for me, coming my, from my tradition, I always think about uh, the Passover dinner of Jesus of Nazareth. Um, and back in biblical times, who you sat down to dinner with said everything about the world that you ascribe to and that you wanted to bring into the future. And I always was, I was a pretty bad Sunday school student, but I was always interested in the idea of a table in which who you invited said something about your vision for the world. And so who did Jesus invite to his table? He invited sex workers. He invited children. He invited those who were sick. He invited those who worked for the enemy, the Roman state tax collectors. Um, and in doing that, he prefigured another world. But it was very important that it was through food, because this was the thing that could bring people together in the here and now, which could also exemplify what kind of a future society, a society where the first will be last and the last will be first. Um, and so I'm always interested in how people are using food and food ways to articulate their politics and to create situations and places in which politics not with a capital P, can express themselves. And so, Tunde, I want to start with you and your hot chicken shit project. The hot chicken shit was really a, a, a provocation. It was a, uh, an absurd um, proposition. Uh, and the real work was me talking to people behind the scenes and seeing and trying to understand what the problem around affordable housing in Nashville was talking to foundations, talking to folks in economic development office of the city. And the question that, that just kept coming back or the statement that I kept hearing was, everybody wants affordable housing in Nashville, but they would say, but well, who's going to pay for it? Where's the money going to come from? And it, it, it was a strange, it was a strange response because obviously nobody was going to pay for it until somebody paid for it. There was no magic money. Somebody had to spend money, whether it was the government or private, 
individuals. There was no market case for affordable housing or to keep, um, in, in this case, Black folks secured in their community. But there was some sort of mental block uh, because nobody could see a market case, then they couldn't see a solution. Um, we ended up uh, raising $100,000. It was actually from one lady and she just, you know, she, she, she didn't even eat the chicken. Well, it sounds like, and, I, and this is a nice way to kind of bring other folks into the conversation, is that you used food and you used this sort of food setting as a place to bring people together, but also have them have conversations, have them conversate, prompting conversations they might otherwise not have. And that kind of brings a, a nice natural segue, as opposed to my unnatural ones before, to Dawn and John, which is really about using sort of food trucks. And I know, Tonda, you've been interested in doing work with that as well but as a way to prompt conversations that people wouldn't be having otherwise and to disperse knowledge that people might otherwise push away. So maybe you could talk to us a little bit about Conflict Kitchen. Die USA sind in viele Konflikte verwickelt, ob militärisch wie noch bis vor kurzem in Irak, als Schutzmacht für Israel im Nahen Osten oder ideologisch verfeindet wie etwa mit Nordkorea, Venezuela oder Kuba. Diese Länder kennen viele Amerikaner nur als Bösewichte aus den Fernsehnachrichten. Das Takeaway-Restaurant Conflict Kitchen setzt da den Kochlöffel an und serviert wechselnde Menüs aus genau solchen Ländern. L'idea di attirare i clienti con del buon cibo per poi coinvolgere in eventi o dibattiti mirati a stimolare proprio la conoscenza della cultura e della politica di alcuni stati come per esempio l'Iran, l'Iraq, Cuba, Venezuela e la Corea del Nord. ويبدو أن فكرة المطعم تجاوز ذلك بتوظيفها الطعام لإضفاء مسحة إنسانية على الحروب والنزاعات. So you order uh, Iranian food or Persian food, anywhere from five to eight dollars, and they give it to you wrapped up in a wrapper that has conversations from people that are in that country. It features the opinions of Palestinians living on the West Bank and in the United States. When seine Köstlichkeiten auspackt, dann erfährt man etwas über Afghanistan, zum Beispiel, was ist die aktuelle Regierung oder was sind die Rechte der Frauen? Eine Art kulinarische Völkerverständigung. I think what they do is fantastic. They inform people about issues that are otherwise unknown in the United States. Viele Leute denken, wir Afghanen sind Terroristen, vor allem nach den Anschlägen des 11. September. Aber unser Land entwickelt sich weiter und das ist toll, dass man das hier lernen kann. And you know, the country is still thriving. الشعب الامريكي بشكل عام شعب طيب شعب ترى ما بحاول بس يتعرف على على شو اللي موجود في في النزاع ما بين الفلسطينيين والاسرائيليين هذه كانت لهم فرصه انهم يشوفوا من طريقه ثانيه غير عن غير عن الميديا العاديه اللي بيشوفوها على التلفزيون Meine Mutter kommt aus Nordkorea. Ich finde es eine fantastische Idee, den Menschen hier dieses Land über das Essen näher zu bringen. So kann man mit Freunden und Kollegen gleichzeitig darüber reden, was dort passiert. Das ist toll. I think it's really important that the Conflict Kitchen has created a space where we can have an exchange of ideas. In a way, it inspires me to speak out more because I feel like I have to channel that fear that we, we all have, the collective fear, and just channel it into positivity and show that we are united. I teach uh, socially engaged art here at Carnegie Mellon. And for several years, I taught my classes in storefronts throughout the, new, uh, throughout the city of Pittsburgh. And we were in... Uh, a working class neighborhood called uh, East Liberty. And the waffle shop really developed out of um, relationships with our neighbors. There was a, a nightclub, hip hop club, actually kind of everything space called Chatter Lounge that we were neighbors of. And um, we opened the waffle shop late at night, basically in conjunction with the Chatter Lounge. And the idea was to use the seduction, the lure of food, to bring people in to this project, which essentially was a live streaming video talk show in which the customers were both the patrons of the show and the restaurant, the uh, audience members, and the content producers, the people who are on stage. Um, and I think what was interesting to us at that point was 
the idea that anyone who walked in the door could basically perform or be part of any role that was needed in the um, production of this art project or this theater project or this um, who knows what. Uh, and so I think pretty much we ran that for about, I think after a couple of years, I had, again, it started as a class and then it became a kind of its own entity. Uh, Don came on and became the assistant director um, and helped us, you know, outreach into working with lots of people throughout Pittsburgh. Um, but one of the things we learned as opposed to these types of Zoom and whatever situations is, which I, to be honest, tar just hate, you know, going through this as a teacher or an artist or a human, um, was that when you get people together um, around food who ordinarily maybe even are in a restaurant together, but if you create a catalyst for them to engage with each other, that usually food creates a space that that can occur. And we learned really on the fly how to construct that space. Um, and it was very much a kind of call and response. Um, you know, what were people interested in? What were people, we were essentially just a platform for other people to speak on this talk show. And the talk show's content was constructed entirely from the randomness of who walked into the restaurant at any given point. Um, so in some ways, this kind of iterative call and response, learning from being in a place and from the people who participated in it led to some of the initial ideas around Conflict Kitchen. I'm sure Don has some thoughts on it too. So yeah, why don't you pick up here, Don? How do we move from just sort of creating a space and seeing what sort of conversations happen to really directed conversations, often about places and politics that people don't talk about? Things like Venezuela, North Korea, Palestine, and so on. What was that move for you? And how did you find things shifted when you asked people to have those conversations? Right. Well, I think we were being responsive to the situation. As John mentioned, we were parasitic off of um, two bars and nightclubs that bookended us that were co-owned by Justin Strong that actually Tunde met very briefly in, in New Orleans and we got to hang out a bit. Um, and being parasitic off of the shadow lounges patrons to call them into the waffle shop wasn't always successful, right? Because if people are at a, at a show, they just want maybe a quick bite to eat. Um, and in fact, Justin had brought a hot dog vendor to place themselves outside of the shadow lounge and was selling hot dogs for a buck. And we went up to him and said, Justin, what, what are you doing? You're taking away our waffle shop business and we can't get people to go on stage, right? This is These are our content creators. And he said, well, business is business. You have to compete. So in addition to wanting to extend uh, the co-participation of folks, whether they're coming into the waffle shop, but also to expand some of the content that was on stage to make it more specific and to also highlight some of the conversations that we had heard on stage, but people maybe didn't feel as comfortable about sharing. And so to be more directed about that, um, we additionally were thinking about foods that could help to, to bring those conversations up. Um, we thought about foods uh, that weren't culinary culinarily represented within Pittsburgh, um, though we knew many neighbors um, that were perhaps representative of these diasporas and nation states around the world, right? So Iranian food or Afghan food, Venezuelan and Cuban, and realized that we were naming cuisines from countries with which the U.S. government is in conflict. And so while we initially started off serving uh, a taco, we had a taco stand and tried a couple of other different foods in there, we realized that the concept was really around engaging the people that were our neighbors and not necessarily just the foods that that everyone might find immediately or obviously um, delicious, but about using food as an instigation towards curiosity and sometimes a bit of discomfort. And why, and I just saw in one of the clips that we're watching, join a local Iranian for lunch, right? And when you unfold your wrappers, that's the feeling I always got looking at them, that I was joining in a conversation with just everyday people. Um, I wasn't reading a bunch of facts. Why that approach? Why not the standard 10 point type? Here's US foreign policy directed towards Cuba since you know, the mid 1950s. Why did you go for that kind of human contact? Yeah, I think um, 
you know, as Don said, a lot of this cuisine uh, was not represented in the sort of restaurant world of Pittsburgh and was new to many people in Pittsburgh. Uh, and we realized that people are far more comfortable approaching the cuisine of, you know, a country that they might have a negative political viewpoint on than they would be approaching an individual from that country and talking about politics, especially if they're a stranger, especially on the street, which is where our project existed. Um, and so there is a kind of space opened up in that moment of curiosity um, that the food created. And we immediately thought to fill it with, um, with stories and more specifically stories from people from that country and from the diaspora. Um, and yeah, we were not trying in any way to be an exhaustive or encyclopedic or factual as if that exists account of what's going on in the country. We were trying to open up um, a series of sometimes divergent viewpoints from people who are living in each country um, in order to not simplify perspective, but to start to complicate what people might think about a place that, um, you know, they might have a very narrow or limited um, set of uh, viewpoints on to begin with. And, you know, in Pittsburgh, I mean, you know, we're kind of, I don't, folks are friendly here. People are open, um, you know, by and large, people were really curious about the cuisine. They were really curious about these countries. Um, and, you know, we were actually maybe even surprised initially about the kind of level of curiosity that people had. Don, um, do you think there was something about, I don't know, the basicness of food that actually kind of worked as, I'm going to speak about, let me back up a little bit. So when I was a community organizer 25, 30 years ago, one of the things I would do is I'd walk around, for example, I was working on an anti-gentrification campaign and I would recite facts about gentrification and people's eyes would just glaze over. I could see it happening, right? Is this a way of kind of cutting through that connecting to people with facts and abstractions? Is, I mean, does, is food unique in being able to do that and kind of get at the essential humanness? I think that it can be, and we, you know, our work and Tunde's work is, these are examples of how it can be initially. Although I also want to I always complicate and offer um, that it's not that simple, right? Um, and, and I think Tunde speaks to this really well with a number of um, the articles that, that he's written and, and the complication that what happens when we engage with the capitalist system, when we're employing people, um, there is, it's not just a question of, of simply a, a guttural impulse to connect or build bridges through food, but there's someone that's growing the food, there's someone that's cooking the food, there are people that are dealing with the waste products, right? And so I think, um, I think while we initially were able to engage in a, in a number of conversations through all of these different iterations, right? And as John said, it's not about being encyclopedic, it was about starting a conversation um, there are a lot of aspects to to the work um, that uh, I think were personally felt by the workers and, and maybe some of the other patrons that um, that were a part of the complication of what Conflict Kitchen really was. And uh, and definitely, I feel that every day, continuing to work in the in the service industry now for twenty seven years. Do you want to speak to this a little bit? The idea of well, food is great because we all eat. Right. We all love food, um, yet it can also be a means to open up a space for more complicated, abstract conversations, discussions, revelations about the things that can't be seen right in front of us. Right. It's kind of a pathway into complexity. Uh, my my choice to um, use food as a medium is is personal in that um, I happen to fall into owning a restaurant. I happened to, and then that restaurant became uh, somewhat successful. And, and then I decided that this is the path that I'm, I'm going to use um, to say the things that I, I need to say. But I don't, I don't think that there's anything special about food beyond it being something that we all, uh, that we all do or we all need to do. Um, but I don't, see food as any more powerful than any 
other medium necessarily. I think depending on, on the context, food may make uh, more sense. I think this idea that food is a place that folks can come together, you know, uh, um, sort of like negates a lot of Americans' personal relationship with food and dining and coming together, right? If, if, if you think about Thanksgiving, I think for a lot of people, that's a really hard time, you know, and it's over food and nobody wants to go home and like, especially, you know, you know, the last few years where um, I think, um, I think white Americans have seen like political or intergenerational political divisions play out at the dinner table when you have a parent that is a Trump supporter and you have children that are, are progressive or whatever, you know, food doesn't solve that. Food doesn't like help with that. No matter how um, delicious the food is, I think the most, probably the most important thing that creates the possibility of compromise or change is proximity to the issue. So if two or more people are deeply affected by an issue, uh, you bring them together over food, you bring them together over water, bring them together over nothing. Um, if there's enough incentive, um, they can find a solution or they can find some sort of compromise. Um, so this is not to, uh, you know, diminish the power of food, but I think we should not overestimate its power too. What I heard you say, which I think is a really, really key point, is that food, like many art forms, is a medium. Um, and it's a means, it's not necessarily ends. And oftentimes, I think in this sort of art and activism, is people forget that, that it becomes the end in upon itself. And so what I'm hearing from all of you is that you're using this as a means to move something else. Um, whether it's a discussion or whether it's fundraising or whether it's a deepening understanding of other people in places and in situations and spaces which are unfamiliar to one or familiar to each other and not knowing that. Which brings up for me the impact question, which is what do you hope happens when people engage in one of your projects outside of the hundred thousand dollars, obviously, we all hope for that, right? Um, but what do you hope? You know, what is the ideal scenario for you? And anybody can just jump in here. I mean, I, I hope there's, there's an encouragement of understanding one's responsibility and role within our food ways and food systems, and with whatever, if we're choosing to use food as a medium with which we are engaging in that as a medium. Um, and, and also to come to some greater sense of admittance of ignorance and a transparency of that perhaps, and that that can bring then to people that previously couldn't identify that they felt maybe complicit within a part of a system or ignorant about a particular element of a system that they were participating in or supporting um, as Tunde is saying, whether it's around water or food or, you know, create, doing some labor together, right, to actually begin to, if there is a disagreement, to come to some sort of compromise um, to continue to build together. And I think that engages, again, that sense of um, uh, curiosity in one's own complicity um, and, that, and an accountability for that. Um, within some of the things that we're trying to talk about, right? So it's real nice to to talk about others um, within these sorts of, of situations, but um, always bringing it back to ourselves, I think is, is something we, we try to engage a conflict kitchen, um, certainly at the takeout window as a performative nexus is the project of the project. John, while we're waiting for Tindy to come back from purgatory, what are you hoping an audience member for lack of a better term, or a patron, um, walks away with. You know, one of the things that was really interesting to me about Conflict Kitchen is that we were open every day for seven years. That we, as an artwork, and as an education project, and as a restaurant, and as whatever else we were, we were in people's lives. You could ignore us, certainly for years and years. You might hear about it as a rumor. You might have eaten the food and have no idea what the hell was going on, right? You might have eaten there for a month and not known the premise under which the uh, you know, food that you were eating was being um, 
you know, related to specific nations and stories. And, uh, and to me, that was interesting, you know, rather than I think the notion of art coming at you in a very sort of opaque and, you know, obvious way, which is sort of some of the problems of um, activism that I find is that, you know, it's really easy to see it coming and it's really easy to turn away. Um, and just by being there like any other business, struggling like any other business, dealing with the realities of, of life of a restaurant or a nonprofit, um, I think allowed us to kind of be part of the fabric of public life in the city and accrue a set of relationships that perhaps wouldn't have happened if we just sort of popped up and, and left. Um, and people have asked, you know, during the time in which we ran the project and subsequently to do kind of these quickie versions of Complex like Kitchen. And it never really felt like, it, or it felt fundamentally like the, the main element of the work that was valuable and that perhaps was valuable to the public, which was our struggle to exist within the economic structures of the city um, was part of the medium as well. Um, and people could witness and participate in that in equal measure. Um, we don't talk about duration enough in this sort of work, about what is it like to have a project be part of people's lives, both culinarily, but also kind of almost the backdrop and the background and how it becomes part of the patterns of everyday life. Um, but I want to ask uh, Sunday the same sort of question, which is, what do you hope an audience, patron, however we want to define these, what do you hope that they get out of one of your projects? What, do you, what experience do you want them to have? What do you want them to be able to give back? However you want to define that. Um, I think for me, it just depends on, it depends on the project that, I, um, that I'm doing. Um, I, you know, the questions that I'm engaged with personally and professionally are so big and, um, you know, there's, I guess there's space for individuals in this, in these sort of like large questions around capitalism and race and, um, you know, colonialism or whatever it is. I guess there's a role for individuals with different spheres of influence to make an impact. And, uh, you know, I hope that folks make an impact, whether they come to my project or they interact with something else. But I also feel, and I, I don't think this is pessimistic, I also feel like, you know, I'm not in control. Nobody's in control, really, of how change happens. And also, I'm partial to my idea of what, my view of change is and that could be in conflict with somebody else's idea and somebody who could be just as well-meaning as 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 me and so i think that um things are complicated uh conflict is a continuous part of of life and and living and you know maybe the best that we can expect is you know is some grace as we're all just moving uh, moving along and and trying to make things happen i mean there's serious issues for sure there's the issues of poverty issues of discrimination of death um of violence uh but the world is just so complicated um that having so sort of like hopes for projects that are limited in scope, whether it's duration wise or in terms of how many people they actually touch, um, that it's, for me, it's, it's a better idea to focus on my exertion in the work than, you know, what I hope people leave with. We used to call it back in the eighties when it was a really bleak time to be an activist, existential activism. You act not knowing what the outcome is going to be, but because to not act was to be less than human. Um, and it really makes us think about impact in a very different way because we can't control those things necessarily. And so one impulse might be, well, why bother at all, right? But it seems what you're saying, Tunde, and since I know all of you have been in this game for a long time, is that you have to approach it differently. 
and not think about when you think about impact as I do X and it will generate Y because it often doesn't generate Y. And the beautiful thing about working with arts and activism is it can generate things you never thought were going to happen. So I want to ask that question to you. What is the most surprising response you've had to your projects? It can be good. It can be bad. But just like, oh, my gosh, that is not what I thought was going to happen. Um, Steve, can I just address the last question a little bit, just for a second? Because I think often, and you know this, I'm sure pretty well, often that is the question we get from foundations, granting agencies, right? Measure your impact. Um, you know, how many students, how many community members, how many events, how many, um, et cetera. And, you know, I remember us spending an enormous amount of time writing grant reports to validate, uh, you know, money we had received. And, and often in these kind of like spreadsheet ways, which were antithetical, to be honest, to the nature of like the conversation and the activity that we were doing and, and concerned about on a daily basis. We were like, what's the next compelling idea or form we can give to this project? Um, you know, what did we learn? What went wrong with the last thing we did? And how can we fix it without thinking about it's like economic bottom line, the number of people, just without just breaking it down to numbers. And I think that in, you know, arts, where art meets activism, you see a kind of problematic space occur, right? Where I think sometimes, you know, and I know we were, Part of this is you create rhetoric around the work that's not really based on the values that you're wrestling with on a daily basis in order to validate it to granting organizations. Um, and there's certainly great people working in those organizations, but I just want to kind of point to that uh, measure structure and what it, what, what it, the boxes it makes artists work through. Yeah, and it also means that you're less attuned and open to these sort of surprises that you're thinking about because you're actually trying to think about your project in terms of these demonstrable impacts, which you can have to predict in order to give to the funder as well. And so there isn't that place for surprise. And so sometimes you overlook it. Um, but to return to surprise, um, what has surprised you in this work? I think for me, the... the the biggest just sort of like material surprise was um, collecting the $100,000, um, what was this now, four years ago, maybe, um, for the hot chicken soup project. I, you know, I when I when I put out the proposition of selling hot chicken in exchange for a home, I, I, you know, I didn't think it would happen, but I also didn't think it would not happen. I was just like, whatever. I was open to, to it happening or not happening but it was um a day before the 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 dinner where we were supposed to sell the the hot chicken and i hadn't gotten any commitments uh and i think maybe that yeah the the, the day before I, I gave a talk somewhere and i was just like you know said what i needed and the person who eventually gave the money was there and she she heard it and i don't know felt felt compelled to to give um so, uh, and I think, you know, I found out on my birthday. So, so that was like a, that was like a surprise. Uh, but an addendum to the surprise is that, you know, that money didn't do anything. <laughs> Nashville is worse. So, uh, yeah, surprises are, I guess, personal. How about an unpleasant surprise? We can move from Tunde to Dawn at this point. What was something that happened like, oh, shit, didn't hope, you know, that was not something I had planned. And, but it wasn't necessarily a positive response, or at least not positive at the moment. Any controversies? I mean, I think if you're if you're in community with the people that you're doing the work and you're a part of these communities, there there's not a lot that's going to surprise you in terms of when there is when agonism moves to antagonism, whether it's personal and institutional antagonism or within collaboration or between worker and employer or within different elements of a food system, 
I mean, that's ultimately going to happen if because we're a part of these different systems. Again, as Tony is pointing to capitalism and the, the violence that exists within these systems. So it's I don't know that there were that there were too many surprises. Uh, I would say I I would say that I'm surprised at when there is an agonism that moves to antagonism, the amount of time it takes to heal and process from those moments and whether that happens within the project or between people or within a personal level, right? And it just points to, right, we want to talk about a lot of stuff that's happening um, through food in community, um, it takes a long time to do that. It takes dedication to do that. And of course, that's going to um, point to and sometimes exacerbate uh, some of the, the violence that exists in these systems. And, and there will need to be time also dedicated to not only invitations and entrances, but also um, exits and uh, ways for people to again, process and heal and then repair and regenerate, right? Because if we're to move from transactional productivity, right, which is what these organizations are requesting of us, or maybe sometimes we request of each other, but if we're going to think reproductively and rep in repair, then it just takes time, right? It does take time. And, and how, do, and again, pointing back to, and, and within time, is an expression of grace, I would hope. So as, as they pointed to before as well. Do you think that the model of the table and sitting down actually provides us a model for thinking about working through antagonisms as opposed to, I'm thinking of, as you talked about before, the sort of transactional or the, the debate um, model of political discussion and political discourse? Is there something about almost metaphorically the idea of sitting down and being in communion with food and sharing food that provides us a model for thinking about um, working through antagonisms? You know, even today, it's like uh, I'm in a kitchen because this is where I can get it. the the only way I can do internet access living in a in a rural area to do this sort of format or one day coming in and out or um, we can't separate these systems that are um, and and nor should we separate that in the work I think that uh, are interdependent in their agonism that's moving to the antagonism. So, and I think that as artists, we can approach this work by nestling these things inside of each other, right? So sure, it could be a table, but it could also be within a kitchen or a compost heap or, because this is, these things aren't separable. Um, so I think recognizing that and building the medium from there um, is a way I've been trying to approach it to just recognize that yeah, this is a reality. Let's not pretend like it's not. All of you are, food is not your only medium, right? So, but what are the sort of crossovers that you try to bring through all of your projects, whether you're working with food or you're working with other mediums as well? And I think Dawn, you're kind of touching on this, that there's, there's a, a guiding spirit that food can actually work at this moment for this project but it doesn't have to be just about food. But for each of you, what is that sort of, I don't know, design continuum or spirit that goes through all of your work, whether it's about food or not? What do you try to do with your work? Tunde, I'm gonna pick you just because we're gonna grab you before you disappear into purgatory. Yeah, uh, I think for me, it's the cycle of, not to sound too dramatic, but the cycle of like, despair and joy like that to me is like my design process is like you you want to do something and then you feel like you can do it and then you start and you're like oh my god this is really horrible it's not going to work and then you see glimpses of genius or what you think is genius and then you celebrate that and that's joyful and you just keep being honest to the best of your extent in that possible time and then you then you let it go. But I think that um, by, by, by let it go, I mean you let it out into the world so that people can see it or so that it can be 
whether people see it or not. Uh, and I think for me, that has been um, the process, whether it's food or it's writing or, you know, making uh, other kinds of work. So, yeah. How about you, before we go to audience questions, how about for you, John, and then for you, Dawn, very quickly, what is the through line for you in your work? I mean, I don't know if there's a single through line, but I do think about the idea, and maybe this is parallel to joy, which is play. And, uh, you know, as someone who teaches and was taught art, we fundamentally question all the materials put in front of us um, and we reimagine their use and nothing seems stable or permanent um, and everything is open uh, you know to be repurposed in some way and, and I think working publicly and socially that methodology is brought to thinking about you know how what is an institution you know, what is, uh, what is a nation? What is, uh, you know, how do, how do we construct our identities from individuals to, you know, to groups? And, um, and how does the role of imagination basically sit at the core of all of that? And how could theoretically, when it works, we all collectively reimagine other possibilities? And again, sometimes they just come and they go and they don't, you know, not everyone believes equally. And I think as an artist who I've worked on a couple of projects that have these kind of quasi institutional structures, um, you know, it's kind of like, why does it need to be this way? Like who decided? Um, how might, I think a question we asked a lot in Conflict Kitchen is like, we don't have to do anything the way we're doing it already or the way in which someone else has done it. Um, how can we continually reimagine this thing and recognize the fiction within it? Which is difficult, you know, when you have really difficult, you know, everyday realities to fend with. But I think that's a, a way of viewing the work that is usually the most healthy, if you can maintain it. I love the idea of play because it not only gets at this notion of improvisation, which a lot of play is, but it's joyful, it's fun. Um, it, and that that's something we can bring into the work itself. How about you, Dawn? What's, what's a through line for you? Well, I'm not always the best at this, but I'm practicing towards presence. So, I mean, I think for, for joy and play, you need to be present and in doing some learning recently over the last couple of years and some better listening and hopefully hearing, I'm thinking about people like abolitionist Ruth Wilson Gilmore, who speaks about abolition, not in terms of absence, but in presence. So that it's not about getting, you know, something may disappear and we don't use the same tools with which to rebuild and regenerate, but we will still potentially can use and, and, and repair with the same material. And sometimes that material are pieces of a system. Um, sometimes it's people, sometimes it's relationships. And I think that to do that, you have to acknowledge the presence of all of these things that they don't, as something goes away, it doesn't disappear, but we can't, it can move into a new form. And hopefully as artists and activists, we're constantly in a space to be present enough to allow things to change into the form that will help them to be reproductive. The idea of moving or joining critique in production or critique in creation, I think is so important um, because I think oftentimes activists and artists themselves get caught at the level of critique and not seeing how the creation, and that's what I'm always I'm inspired by your projects, the creation, something quite simple, food, community, um, a new way of interacting with one another is as important um, as anything else. Um, in any case, I want to turn to some of the um, audience questions. One, something we were just touching on, so actually quite works, is um, what was a moment where you had a lot of fun during these projects? Or what was a moment where you said, this is amazing, this is so awesome what we're doing right now? 
when it comes to cooking, for example, I I love doing it. You know, um, oftentimes I find myself cooking alone because of the nature the nature of the work. So I you know I go into kitchens that are not mine and I take over the kitchens to host my dinners. And I was thinking about presents, um, just to the most base level. It, I can't imagine a place where you have to be more present than in a restaurant kitchen. Literally, you have to be in that moment, in that place, in that space, and interacting with all of these other people and interacting with all of these orders. And it really just demands you be in that moment. Um, I know it's using presence a little bit different than what you're talking about, Don. Um, but I'm thinking about that notion of just being in that place and space right now. Um, how about uh, either John or Dawn, a joyful moment? Yeah, for me, it was work in the window of the restaurant, at least in that project. Um, and when, you know, you're, it's completely improvisational, right? I think everyone who comes up to you is coming up to you with, you know, a unique set of experiences and uh, ideas and perceptions about what you're doing and and knowledge. You know, a lot of people knew, you know, and added to sort of our knowledge of uh, each of the cuisines that we were focusing on. Um, and I think that, to me, that point in which the restaurant hits the public. Uh, I mean, I worked for years at you know as a waiter, so I was more kind of front of the house focused. I think uh, Dawn has done both front and back of the house. But yeah, I mean, I kind of love that moment. Um, I can't say it's, all, I mean, sometimes it's really difficult and hard and, um, but yeah, it's kind of where you see the project constructing itself in relationship with others. Dawn, we're gonna end with this, give us joy, a moment of joy. But I, I think more recently, and as I reflect back on the seven years of Conflict Kitchen and the five years of, of Waffle Shop prior to that and the transition in between, it's, um, it's for me, more recently, it's been about generosity where not only is uh, joy felt when a gift is given, but also a gift is received and that there is um, a moment where each interlocutor is responding to how they're choosing to value themselves. Um, and sometimes that gift is an offering of um, usually of honesty. And I think that those have been the most, the most joyful moments and that they've invited the same for me. And doing that back and forth in community, that begins to build accountability. And so I think the most joy more recently is being able to sit with that with each other and um, that's brought the most joy and that that feels really good. Yeah. As you're speaking, I just the image in my mind literally popped up of sitting at a big table and handing each other food. Um, whether you bring it or you hand it to the person next to you, the passing down, but that idea that, you know, in a lot of ways, a great dinner party is about people giving gifts, um, gifts of their presence, gifts of the food, gifts of the wine or beer or whatever they bring. And so in some ways, it becomes a way of thinking about how to relate to one another, um, nourishing in many different ways. Um, so we're going to kind of wind it up here. Um, I want to wind it up by one, just thanking the three of you actually for giving your time and putting, I hope next time we do this, we're going to sit at a big table and we're going to actually eat um, and see each other not flicker on and off, um, but actually have some sort of presence with one another. Um, I also want to thank everybody out there for coming and joining us for this hour and 20 minutes now. And to think of, you know, this is really as moments of inspiration. It's about revolutionizing activism. It's not about activism that these people have done, which is revolutionary, but it's also about revolutionizing your own activism to draw from some of the ideas and the wisdom and the inspiration and the examples. But in the end, it's about changing your own activism and going out there in the world and bringing new ideas to the work that you've done to bring about new forms of change. 
I hope you enjoyed that conversation. We post these every so often, so you might actually want to subscribe to this channel on YouTube so that you get the updates. Um, again, if you have any ideas for other projects that this reminded you of, um, our site, Actopedia.org, is a great place to find inspiration, but also share projects that you know about. Users can submit and have submitted thousands of projects. Our series, Revolutionizing Activism, has other iterations, and you can go back and watch previous conversations. Uh, check those out if you like this one. You can also support the Center for Artistic Activism by donating. Um, if you saw us and, and would buy us a coffee, then that's fine. You can donate that amount of money at c4aa.org slash donate. It's tax deductible. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Um, if you want to give more, we'd appreciate it. It's support like that that allows us to do this project um, and to put out these public programs. Um, so please consider it. You can also sign up to join our newsletter uh, at the site c4a.org slash newsletter, which will allow you to get regular updates from the center, um, resources like this, a lot of the free resources that we publish, workshops that we're putting out um, online and in person. That whenever we can have people join them, we announce that on our newsletter. So sign up for that. This conversation is supported by donors like you, as well as the support of the Four Doves Foundation and Andrea Soros-Columbell. So I want to give thanks to them. And we'll see you next time.